This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Hello and welcome to the Worship of God with the First Presbyterian Church in South St. Paul on this, the 10th Sunday in Ordinary Time, or Graduation Sunday. This year we have one high school graduate, but fortunately for us, it is the best one. And so we want to recognize and congratulate Mason Rauer on her graduation from Central High School in St. Paul and let her know that as she moves into this next stage of her lifelong adventure, she has our support and encouragement, our prayers and love, and the continued blessing of God. Now, because we wanted to make sure we included all of our post-secondary graduates as well, whether it was a bachelor's degree, associate's degree, or the completion of a technical program of study or certi certification program, I looked up the word graduate to see just exactly who gets to be included. And it read, a person who has successfully completed a course of study or training. Two weeks ago, I received a photo from my daughter Emily of my four-year-old grandson Finn in cap and gown for his graduation from preschool. He looked fantastic. I may have cried a little. And I thought to myself that, well, this was nice. It wasn't really graduation. But then there is that very broad definition, successfully completed a course of study or training. Maybe Finn did graduate. And so I'm positive that there are many more of us who graduated this past year than we are acknowledging today. And to all of them, we want to say congratulations on your accomplishments. Well done. Now, where are the little silver dollar sandwiches and potato salad? Just a few announcements today. Since the outdoor worship service a couple weeks ago was so well received, we're going to do it all over again on Sunday, June 20th, Father's Day, at 10 a.m. on the north side of our property. This time, the live streaming will be working, and we will have a new portable amplification system so everyone can hear what's being said and or sung. That's right, there will be singing. On Sunday, June 27th, at 11 a.m. on Zoom, there will be a congregational meeting for the purpose of electing new officers and next year's at-large nominating committee members, as well as to approve changes to the church bylaws, primarily to incorporate things like having the ability to conduct congregational meetings virtually on Zoom. The irony is not lost on anyone. Also, this June we have two missions of the month. More Light Presbyterians, of which more will be said about them during today's Minute for Mission, and Presbyterian Clearwater Forest. I believe some of our members are up there camping right now and potentially watching the worship service there as well. If you have photos of Clearwater Forest, old and or new, please send them to Alita in the church office no later than tomorrow, June 7th, to be included in a montage we are putting together for next Sunday. And finally, a reminder about an educational, adult educational opportunity this coming Tuesday, June 8th at 6.30 on Zoom for a replay of Interfaith Action's Earth Day event, Interconnections for Environmental Justice with Michael Quinn Patton. More information is in the June Tower Views, which can also be found on the church website. As always, remember that the building may be closed, but the church remains open. And now let us begin our worship of God together with a moment of centering silence.
And now let us continue to call ourselves to worship. We enter a virtual gathering space once again this day. We worship together in spirit and in truth, though not in person. We pray, sing, and listen to God's word, despite the divisions that pervade our communities. We trust Christ's peace, a peace given freely, despite our doubts and fears. We know the Holy Spirit is among us, blowing with a hopeful wind of change. We feel the presence of God, the one from whose love we can never be separated. We open ourselves to God's leading in this time of transformation. We experience the joy of new beginnings when we celebrate God's faithfulness and desire for our wholeness. Every week, as we worship together, we have the opportunity to admit to ourselves, to each other, and to God, that we do not always live as we are called. In this time of prayer, this time of opening our hearts, let us remember that God is merciful and just, eager to offer grace and love. Let us pray. We confess our struggle to be transformed into disciples, God of mystery. The desires of the world would shape us into people you would not recognize. The demands of our society pull us away from your heart. Our culture values the rich, the powerful, and the privileged, but you are on the side of the weak, the poor, the outcast, and the oppressed. Forgive us, merciful God, for looking for you in the wrong places. Reawaken us with your voice that calls us to service. Revive our weary hearts with your vision of a new creation. Refresh our fatigued spirits that we might boldly proclaim our desire to follow Jesus and go forth to serve our siblings in your holy name. Amen. And now receive the assurance of God's amazing grace. God is merciful and gracious, full of forgiveness, abounding in love and overflowing with blessing. 
let us receive the gift of forgiveness and live this day with new hope and the strength to love. Good morning and welcome to Children's Time. I'm so glad you're here with me today and I hope you all are having a fantastic week. Now today is a very special day. Today we're celebrating graduation from school. Now I'm sure most of you are really excited that the school year is ending and summer is starting. And for some people, they're all finished with school or they're going on to new schools next year. And today we celebrate with them in their success and cheer for them uh, as they go on to new and different things next year. And today we're especially celebrating our high school graduate, um, but I also want to congratulate anyone who might be graduating from kindergarten or elementary and middle school and even college today. I want us all to remember to be happy and cheer for one another when we do something cool like graduate, but also when we do other cool things like when you read a book by yourself for the first time or you get a gold star on a test or you learn to ride a bike. Any of the other first exciting things that you can do, they all deserve a bit of celebration and cheer from each other. Will you pray with me? Dear God, thank you for this wonderful day Thank you for graduation and new things. Help us to cheer for each other when we do cool stuff. And all God's children said, Amen. Congrats. As the youth coordinator working with both the middle school and senior high school students in our congregation, it is my privilege this morning to recognize Mason Rauer on her completion and graduation from high school. In the book of the prophet Jeremiah, God tells us, For surely I know the plans I have for you, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. Mason and her family came to this congregation many years ago now, and she has family ties to this place that run even deeper and go back much further. And we hope that as she sets out on all her post high school adventures, she will continue to hold this place close to her heart as we promise to support, encourage, and pray for her in all of her future endeavors. We are grateful for the parts she has played in the life of our congregation and look forward to great things from her. And now, please pray with me as we ask for God's continued blessing on her life. Creative and creating God, we thank you for Mason, who was created in your image and will always be your beloved child. We thank you for all her accomplishments, and we celebrate with her at this time of graduation. We bless her today and always with all our love and encouragement, all our care and concern. We pray that she will recognize your guidance on the next stage of her journey. May your loving protection surround her each step she takes, and may she seek always to live according to Jesus' example. Lives of justice, lives of peace, lives of joy. Amen.
ears to hear your word for us this day. Open our eyes to see ways you are working among us. Open our hearts to receive and trust your good news. And open our mouths to proclaim that you are love and to offer that love to all your creation. Amen. A reading from the first book of Samuel. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, You are old and your sons do not follow in your ways. Appoint for us then a king to govern us like other nations. But the thing that displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to govern us. Samuel prayed to the Lord and the Lord said to Samuel, Listen to the voice of the people and all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them just as they have done to me from the day I brought them up out of Egypt to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so also they are doing to you. Now then, listen to their voice, only you shall solemnly warn them, and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So Samuel reported all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, These will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen, and to run before his chariots. He will take your male and female slaves and the best of your cattle and donkeys and put them to his work. He will take one-tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves, but the Lord will not answer you on that day. But the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel. They said, no, but we are determined to have a king over us so that we may also be like the other nations, and that our king may govern us and go out before us and fight our battles. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Did I ever tell you all that the first runner-up Miss USA once asked me out on a date? According to Lisa, with whom last Wednesday we celebrated the anniversary of our first date 33 years ago, <coughs> According to Lisa, I tell it a lot. A lot. So maybe I have already told you, maybe even more than once. In which case I may have also told you that I used to walk to school with supermodel Cindy Crawford. But I suppose that will have to be a story for another day and another sermon. Anyway, as maybe you can imagine, there are a few facts that I may have left out of the Miss USA story. Like, we were in high school. She was a sophomore and I was a junior and it was for the snow days dance. You know, the winter girls ask the guys dance, sometimes referred to as Sadie Hawkins dances. Still, not too bad for a guy who was six foot four and weighed maybe 160 pounds. Had a bowl haircut, acne, and no discernible upper lip or jawline. It wasn't until six years later that she found herself standing on the stage, one of two contestants left. She, the first runner-up, was Miss Oklahoma, where she went to college. And somehow she lost out to Miss Texas. Though, of course, in the event that the winner was unable to fulfill her duties, the first runner-up would take her place. So, there's that. Over the past week, as I was preparing for this very special day when we recognize and celebrate our one and only unique, brilliant, creative, kind, and amazing Mason Rauer, it got me reminiscing and reflecting back on my own high school years and all of the national beauty pageant contestants I once dated. That's right. Once again, I made it all about me. What can I say? It's a gift. I thought back to all my friends, the parties, watching the football games and playing in the basketball games, homecoming weeks, prom, of course snow days, and then somewhere amidst all the social events I also remembered actually going to class and some of my favorite teachers. Now I think just like today we had core courses that we had to take, English, social studies, math, and science. But then on top of those you had elective courses that you could take, one or two each semester. Now, looking back, as I've said before, I probably should have taken the class titled Know Your Car, and a few more of what they called industrial arts classes back then, where you learned woodworking and how to wire a lamp. You know, things that would actually come in handy later in life. But no, every semester I took whatever English literature elective my favorite teacher, Carol Peterson, was going to be teaching. There was one class on the classics, like 
Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, Dante's Inferno, and Chaucer's The Canterbury Tales. There was American literature where we read The Grapes of Wrath, Catcher in the Rye, The Great Gatsby, and To Kill a Mockingbird. One class just on the plays and sonnets of Shakespeare, and one called World Literature with books like A Tale of Two Cities, The Good Earth, and Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment. Yikes. Do I wish that I knew that windshield wipers have their own motor and transmission and how to replace them? Of course I do. But in the same breath, I have to say that I really don't regret having the opportunity to read and discuss these classic books whose pages tell the stories of just about every aspect of the human condition and attempt to give meaning to what can be a very complex and confusing world, especially if you're only 18 years old. Today, we begin a four-week look at one of the Bible's finest written stories, the vast saga of Samuel, Saul, and David, spread over the books of First and Second Samuel and the first two chapters of the book of First Kings. This magnificent epic presents the greatest portrayals of human characters in the ancient world, far outstripping the figures of Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, however much the likes of Achilles and Hector and Odysseus have become the best-known fictional portraits in the Western world. I contend that the prophets Samuel and the first two kings of the tiny land of Israel, Saul and David, should have pride of place in the character sweepstakes. The fact that they don't, and that in most literature courses in our high schools and colleges nearly all read Homer, while few if any read the books of Samuel, is no doubt due to the fact that the latter can only be found ensconced in the pages of the Jewish Christian Bible. And because that is so, reading its pages as literature is hardly the way that the sacred book has been read down through the ages. And I think that's unfortunate. If at all possible, if you can put aside the holiness and the almost divinity that we impose upon the Bible, I want to urge you to read these passages over the next few weeks precisely as literature, since that is in fact what they are. This is not history compiled from se several memoirs or annals of Samuel or David. No, these are not histories in any modern sense. These are created, imaginative stories dreamed by fabulous writers who, while surely using old folk stories and oral memories, conjured the accounts of the founders of the land of Israel as rich and unforgettable human beings, caught in the throes of power and its abuse, and at the same time trying to suggest just what Yahweh had to do with it all. I say they are stories, not in any way to suggest that they are untrue or a kind of glorified lie. Far from it. They are stories in their style, form, and shape. We will not learn their secrets by resort to archaeology or external histories, histories that in fact do not exist. Only the stories themselves, their rich details, will provide for us what we need to explore in them. In short, we can focus our full attention on the text itself, keeping our imaginations honed and sharpened in order to mine the wealth that we have spread before us. God called Abraham to start a new community. Years later, God called Moses to free that community from enslavement in Egypt. These new beginnings were initiated simply with a vision for greatness and an encounter with a bush that didn't burn, respectively. In his conversations with Abraham and Moses, God neither mentioned nor hinted of the dangers that lay ahead. It is not entirely clear why the ancient Israelites transitioned from a tribal society into a monarchy in the early Iron Age, sometime in the late 11th or 10th century BCE. Up until this point, the most significant transition between leaders in the biblical text occurs when Moses dies and Joshua, Moses' assistant, takes over. After that, the biblical text describes a fairly haphazard state of affairs in which charismatic leaders, judges, 
rose up from time to time to lead groups of Israelites generally into battle, culminating in the figure of Samuel. As the author of Judges records, in those days there was no king in Israel. All the people did what was right in their own eyes. But by the time we get to the passage that Mason read for today, the Israelite community has experienced great territorial expansion and population growth, and they recognize that the old forms of leadership will no longer do. They need a new leader. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, You are old, and your sons do not follow in your ways. Appoint for us then a king to govern us like all other nations. However, installing a monarchy would be asking for trouble, and in fact this new stage in Israel's communal life, the movement from divine king to human king, begins with a very stern warning from God. These will be the ways of the king who will reign over you, he says. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen, and to run before his chariots. He will take your male and female slaves and the best of your cattle and donkeys and put them to his work. He will take one-tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. God makes it crystal clear. Kingship, no matter how much Israel wanted it, no matter how <coughs> attractive it might seem, was a bad idea. Now, bad idea or not, the people insist, and God, for some inscrutable reason, relents. To teach them a lesson, perhaps, to punish them, maybe, or because, like a parent sending their children out into the world, we have to allow room for them to make their own mistakes. You know, free will and all that. Possibly. God and later the people choose Saul, whose only qualifications were that he was tall and handsome. Later in the story, Scripture tells us Saul was a handsome young man. There was not a man among the people of Israel more handsome than he. He stood head and shoulders above everyone else. Nothing but height and good looks. These qualifications may get him approved by the people and anointed by Samuel, but they will neither make him an effective ruler nor keep him in the exalted position. Ultimately, tragically, Saul will fail at a job he neither sought nor wanted. But more about that in weeks to come. So what is God's Spirit saying to us today in this story? What are we supposed to take away? What is the relevance? I'm not sure, but I know I'm not a big fan of that word relevance. Is that the only purpose for reading and hearing Scripture? Its relevance to our lives today? Is everything the only thing that the Bible has to teach us? A contemporary life application? Every now and then I see advertising, marketing for other churches promoting relevant sermons. Now, I have nothing against rel relevant sermons. In fact, I find them much more enjoyable than irrelevant sermons, like this one. But if that has become the primary motivation for reading scripture or going to church, to find out what's in it for me this week, well, I just don't know. Maybe sometimes the passage read from the Bible and the sermon aren't about you, about us. Maybe, just maybe, sometimes they're about God, listening to and for God to tell us something that we didn't know before, to remind us of just what kind of God God is. A God who loves us so much, who finds us to be of such immeasurable value that no matter how arrogant and greedy, selfish and violent we can be, continues to shower us with grace and mercy who loves, loves us enough to let us make our own mistakes and suffer the consequences of our actions, and yet a God who is always with us and present among us, sustaining us along this crazy adventure and calling us to new life and a future filled with hope. Maybe, just maybe, there's nothing for you to do today except listen to a story and remember that God forgives and loves and blesses us, just as God has always forgiven, loved, and blessed us. 
that God remembers us even when we, the beautiful and the broken, forget God and all God is. Maybe on this day which God has made, it is enough to just remember that and to rejoice and be glad. And to God alone be all the glory. Amen. Hi, I'm Alex, Executive Director at More Light Presbyterians. And I'm Jess, Program and Communications Manager for More Light Presbyterians. More Light's work in the world is about creating spaces so that everyone knows that they are beloved. And at the center of that work is a belief in a God of infinite abundance. We believe God is bigger than we could ever imagine. Following God's abundance, we believe that we are all invited to confront God's holy abundance with awe and wonder. And we know that we are abundant because our creator is abundant. 
Morelight believes that members and churches live into this understanding of God's abundance through a developmental journey, which begins with a deepening understanding of a theology of God's abundance, and then extends into the organization, leadership, and practices of our faith communities, and spiritual practices of faith in action. Our programs and resources are designed to help individuals and congregations, like y'all, respond to an abundant God through policies and practices of transformative inclusion. For over 45 years, More Light's mission has been to equip congregations and individuals to live out their welcome for LGBTQIA people within their congregations and by putting their faith into action. One of the gifts LGBTQIA leadership offers the church is a spirit of adaptation and innovation. Queer and transgender people have always found a way to be community when there was no way. In the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, we are building on this tradition by supporting congregations and pastoral leaders in innovating their worship to adapt to online formats and find unique ways to cultivate and care for their communities. More like congregations have long been an in-person respite and place of care for marginalized communities. We are acutely aware that in this isolating time, LGBTQIA people are particularly vulnerable, whether they live in homes that don't support their identities or are working lower wage jobs that are the first to be cut when companies tighten their belts. Our hope is that more like congregations, with our support, can remain on the lookout for ways to support LGBTQIA people and all marginalized communities in their wider community, and thus model what it looks like to care for those beyond your sanctuary walls. We are a community shaped by the good news, called to love one another as God loves us to be agents, ambassadors of the love which is God, in, with, and to this tired and hungry, amazing and beautiful world. And the sharing of our financial gifts is also an act of love, supporting the works of hope and faith that set us apart as followers of Jesus and his living body in the world. It is through this act of gratitude and generosity that we proclaim our trust not only in God's promises, but also our trust in one another to be the church, beloved children with a common commitment and devotion to realize a peaceable world and make the beloved community through acts of love. Trusting in your faithful generosity, let us dedicate these gifts and offerings. Let us pray. You have overflowed our lives, O oh God, with gifts of love and kindness. Everything of worth we have ever had has come from you. Now, teach us to live and to give with grateful hearts, that we may value the giver more than the gifts, and be faithful to you with joyous spirits and generous lives. In your holy name we pray. Amen. We come from many places, differing in age, differing in gender, differing in race, differing in politics, and even our understanding of God. As we come together around the table, we discover that our differences are not something we tolerate, but that our differences are indeed a blessing the more difference we bring, the more fully we experience the presence of the sacred in our midst. So come, children of God, just as you are. Wherever you are on this journey of life, you are welcome here. Here in this place, here in this community, here at this table. Come, children of God, come and celebrate with us. And now, let us bow together in prayer and give thanks. It is our greatest joy, eternal God, maker of heaven and earth, to give you thanks and praise. You formed the universe in your wisdom and created all things by your power. 
you set us in families of the earth to live with you in faith. We praise you for these good gifts of bread and cup and for the table you spread in the world as a sign of your love for all people. We remember this day with joy the grace by which you created all things and made us in your own image. We rejoice that you called a people in covenant to be a light to the nations. Yet we rebelled against your will. In spite of prophets sent forth to us, we continue to break your covenant. In the fullness of time, you emptied yourself being born in human likeness in the person of Jesus, revealing to all what can be seen of God in our humanity and what a life filled with your spirit looks like. Incarnate by your Holy Spirit, born of your favored one Mary, sharing our life, he reconciled us to your love. At the Jordan, your spirit descended upon him, anointing him to preach the good news of your reign. He healed the sick and fed the hungry, manifesting the power of your compassion. He sought out the lost and broke bread with sinners, witnessing to the fullness of your grace. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and cup, that sharing them together, we may be brought into communion with your living presence and with all your children in every place, that we might be reminded of the bonds of our common humanity. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. By the fire of your spirit, O God, forge us into one church, many and different people together in your loving embrace. Set our hearts aflame with a passion for the truth and desire for justice, that our witness to you may burn brightly in lives of joyful discipleship. Keep us faithful in your service until the community of God is fulfilled among us and we shall feast with all your saints in the joy of your eternal presence. Holy mystery of love, all glory and honor are yours now and forever. Let us pray together the prayer Jesus taught us saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Jesus said, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Come to me and never be hungry. Trust in me and never thirst. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
maybe, just maybe, there is nothing for you to do today except listen to a story and remember that God forgives and loves and blesses us, just as God has always forgiven, loved, and blessed us. That God remembers us, even when we, the beautiful and the broken, forget God and all God is. Maybe on this day which God has made, it is enough to just remember that and to rejoice and be glad. And now may the blessing of God, the grace and love of our Divine Mother and Father, the compassion and humility of the Christ, the inspiration and communion of the Spirit be with you and abide in you from this day forward and forevermore. Amen.